Pili no mai kako me ke aloa pakahi a pau. O wau o hana lei koliaro kahu. O kahale puli o pu'u honua o i au. Welcome to our broadcast, everybody. Grab your bai balas. Koko aloa hana. Noho i lalo. We are on word for the liba. Go to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. You know, anybody who writes one letter usually enum with some kind of admonition, you know, some kind of word of encouragement like that. The Apostle Paul was no different when he didn't write to the church of Thessalonica. In fact, he says, uh, chapter 5, 1 Thessalonians, verse 23, And the very God of peace sanctify you wholly, and I pray God your whole spirit, soul, and body be preserved blameless unto the coming of our Lord. He mentions three parts, spirit, soul, and body. We need to be prosperous and healthy in all three parts of the Kanaka. Your spirit is the spirit of the Lord. May your breath be his breath. We commune, we commune on the spirit plane. I think Brother Ezwin put him in a good way there. We Kanaka live in both worlds. I think Brother had him over there. So we're going to bring some clarity to his, uh, to his music, to the words at least that was uh, interjected in his music. God is spirit. We who worship him must do it in spirit and in truth. Your soul being consists of your mind, your will, your emotions. That's the soul man. Then you have this part, the part that everybody can see. You can slap yourself or slap the person next to you. <laughs> that's, a, that's a flesh part. Paul was saying to the church of Thessalonica, may the Lord bless you in all of these three areas. My friend, God like commune with his sons. We are the, we are the sons of God. We have been made in, in his image. In the image of God created he them, male and female, we're told in the book of Genesis. And God's desire was to continue this communion with mankind. In fact, the beauty of this is that God gave man complete jurisdiction over all of his creation. He told Adam and Eve, he says, take dominion, bring creation under subjection. Uh, you rule and reign. In fact, your authority stems within the confines of this garden. God not only did that and commissioned man, but he also input one uh, tree inside there that he says, this one, tapu, no eat. Everything else, help yourself. The day you eat of this, you go in make. See, God knew he had to give man and let man know that he, he not one slave driver. Man has a free will. You can do, you can will to do the will of the Lord or you can will to do your will. The choice is yours. God would never override your will. So by putting this tree in the garden, man literally could continue in his uh, rule and reign as sons of God in his inheritance. Full dominion. You know what's really funny about this is that before that guy, what is his name? Christopher Columbus, we go cruise the world and we figure out what's wrong. We already found out in the world, in the word here, that the world is already around because the Lord sits upon the circles of the earth. In fact, there will come a time where the earth will be made his footstool and that every knee would bow and every tongue would confess. Cultures of the world have this mana'o in regards to their spirituality, their form of spirituality, and the reality is that it all crossbreeds across the uh, the cultural lines, if you stop and really think about that. I've studied the word, I've studied cultures of the world, and there's a common truth within all of these cultures that really, if you go through the word of God, you can actually see it for yourself. You know, there's some uh, unfortunate things that, that preachers and people who, who supposedly live and die by this word, in their ignorance, they make certain statements and they make uh, people of culture look like fools and heathens. But the reality of the matter is that God is responsible for the practices of every culture. I mean, from sa uh, blood sacrifices all the way down to everything, uh, building stone altars, for example. And we're going to cover these uh, topics in this broadcast that will hopefully be aired on a continual basis. This has been our first one, so it's a little bit of excitement going through my veins right now, knowing that I I'm allowed to touch kanakas on a high level. So you, makanaka, you, spirit, soul, body, God like bless you as a total being. He kept communion with man, gave man full jurisdiction. That was man's inheritance that was given by God. God put the forbidden tree in the garden and he says, the day you partake of this tree, you're going to die. Now we ask ourselves the question, because we know the story, eh? Genesis 3. If you don't know, read the whole book for yourself. You're going to find out the, 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 the storyline. Eh? The storyline says that this uh, uh, Wahine, she was tricked by the serpent. This Takepolo himself, eh? talking to her, deceive her. She heard, like her husband went here, God's instructions about the tree being tapu. But she 
heard, she, heard the Kepolo tell her, ah, God, God, he don't know what he's talking about. He know that if you eat this tree, you're going to eat off this tree, then ah, you're going to be like him. Knowing good from evil, you're going to be like God's. He tricked her, the serpent tricked her. The man who was right next to her blatantly chose to disobey God. So the woman was deceived, but the man chose out of his own free will to disobey God's commandments. Not like he was standing to his low 10 patches away. He was standing right next to her. Baga never do his job. He, being the priest of the home, should have taken the, the, the head of that serpent off. But no, he wouldn't allow his wife to be in be deceived and he blatantly rebelled and disobeyed against the commands of God. Now watch what happens. Here's the storyline. But when go eat him, his eyes was open. Immediately God come walking in the cool of the day. You know, this communion that goes on, yeah. God love walking with mankind. He love walking with you and I. But he comes walking in the cool of the day. And all of a sudden, Adam and Eve, they were gonna make the kind. They were gonna make the first account of malo. They were gonna grab leaves and go make malo. Cover up their shame, shame. At first, no shame, no big deal. Eh? All of a sudden, they go cover up. God come walking. Hey! Adam! Eve, where you guys stay? Ah, who told you you was naked? And, and immediately the man goes through the pastor box syndrome. You know, this is where we will inherit this uh, uh, sin nature of ours. It stemmed right back down to our first father. I like to say forefather, but that's not even folk since he was the first son. Eh? But when he went, tried Pastor Buck, he told God this. He says, you know, Lord, I was doing fine. Until you came, you went punch me out, give me local anesthesia. And I went drop to the ground, and you went to make incision, and you pull out one rib, one Evie. You know, her name was Eve, eh? a Kanaka version of the Eve. Of the Evie is bone, yeah. So from his side, God would pull out one, one bone, and would make her. God knew that man needed one help meet. You see, so the problem with that is that being one help meet is one thing, but the man had an obligation to the Wahines to be his covering, be the priest of the home, be the bouncer at the door. That's another good illustration right out there. Some of you Kanakas can relate to me when I'm talking about bouncers, yeah. Everything that you have right now, currently, is not yours. You've been made a steward of what belongs to God. I mean, from, from your spouses, right down to your children. Okay, so you and your wife had the joys of making a baby. Oh, good, but your baby's going to grow up. And by the way, as I said earlier, they're not yours. God entrusted them to you. It's your obligation to set the example. My father used to tell me, boy, and he was packing. My father was on mason, eh? stone mason. So he had wheelbarrows. He had like four, four to six wheelbarrows every New Year's, packing them with the Miller lights. Eh? Big party our house, always was like that, the whole neighborhood come like that. But, and I remember my father, when I was a little child, tell me, son, no, I don't like to see you do this. No do this, son. No do what daddy do. But I, I think there was a wise counsel from one, uh, you know, from my makua, my parent, to, to me, the, the, the keke, eh, or the kamali. Eh. The problem is that uh, I never take his advice. Guess what son did when son went grow up? Son did exactly what daddy said not to do. Why? That it was the example. I did what he did. I never do what he told me to do. That should give us guys enough fuel right over there to make adjustments, parents. Is that we got to set the example. See, a lot of us carrying a lot of stuff. We carrying plenty baggage from the past. And you might be wondering, oh, where are you going with all of these baggage stuff? What are you talking about? Listen, you go doctor. You got to fill out pepper or they start asking you questions, yeah? They ask you, what the, you get heart disease in your family? Uh, what about uh, blood pressure? What about heart disease? Uh, diabetes? You know, that's not. The doctor trying to fish. He trying to find out what's trailing your bloodline, because he gonna tell you this. Mark my word. He gonna tell you. Oh, since your father guys and your mother them grandmother guys had them, ah, uh, you get them too. See, we don't live under the rules of this world. We are of this. We're in the world, but we're not of it. Of it. Jesus prayed a prayer and he says, Lord, Father. I pray you keep them because they're in the world, but they're not of it. See, when Christ becomes your Lord and Savior, the rules all shift. You're no longer in the capital's reach no more. You live by faith. Facts in this natural world means nothing in the spirit world. What floats around as facts is really uh, uh, facts interpreted without faith. It's satanic propaganda. <laughs> Listen to that. Let me say that one more time. Facts interpreted without faith is satanic propaganda. So, whose report do you like believe? You like believe the law that says, with his stripes you heal? 
Or you like believe the doctor that says, yep, the symptoms exist. Okay, you can watch for this. Okay, we're going to guinea pig you. We're going to boss your wallet. You're going to flatline everything. And then eventually you're going to die. So they're going to try to soak you every which way they possibly can. Of all of your finances, your wealth and everything, as your health continues to deteriorate. Listen, my friends, you don't have to live under that kind of bondage no more. If you have appropriated Christ as Lord and Savior of your life, you live under new rules. You live under kingdom rules. You don't live by the rules of the web. And I like to see this globe as a world wide web with jurisdiction, principalities over it, of which, mind you, the Lord himself is the creator of it all. He created the, the seen world, the unseen world, that which is in the heavens, in the earth, and beneath the earth. Colossians 1.16 verifies that, 16, 17, 18. Read the whole chapter, you find out for yourself that our God created all things, and for his good pleasure they are and were created. So we, sons of God, must hear the voice of our Father and lay violently, lay with violence in our spirit, claim to that promises. You make his reality become your reality by purely appropriating the faith of God's kingdom. Now, your body may look like the bugger is deteriorating and Satan is blowing all of these facts at you, but you need to lay hold to the faith of God's kingdom, where he says, with my stripes, you heal. Peter wrote it and he says, with his stripes, we were healed, past tense. We gotta live in him in the now. Satan's job is to distract you, just like how he did with Adam and Eve. Try to make them question the authority of God and the inheritance that they had over all creation. God told them, take dominion over my creation, bring everything under subjection, my sons, rule and reign with me. However, this tree, you partake, you're going to die. Now let's ask ourselves that question. Let's go back to the garden scene. Genesis chapter 3. What part of the man died? You see, when God called the man, the woman, and the serpent into accountability, this is what he told them. He says to the serpent, on your belly, you're going to slither, you're going to eat the dust of the earth. Now, in my uh, haula, elementary, kahuku high school, title one, mind you, my entire life, special education, God gave me enough brains inside here to realize that if God didn't crush the serpent to go on his belly, then that bugger must have been stand up erect at one point before God went curse him. Ah, that's not one issue anyway. Let's not, 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 let's not make any issues regarding that. I just thought I'd throw that in and for free, by the way. No charge on your part. Now, this serpent eats the dust of the earth. What is the composites of you and I? What is our makeup, the material? Hey, we come from the same materials of, and minerals of this earth. So it's the Kepalo's job to come after the sons of God. Okay, let's make him a non-issue at this point, since we're still talking about the God in scene. Let's talk about the man and the woman. God told a man, I used to pull your weeds, everything was all good. You never had to do nothing. Just rule and reign with me over my creation. But no, he like make disobedient. Okay, from now on, by the sweat of your brow, you holy kalepo. In fact, when you do that, going to get tons and tissues going to come forth for you. Feed your own family until the day you go back to the composite called the dirt, eh, the Aleppo. <clears throat> now, here's what's really interesting. There was no such thing as death back then. Death, D-E-A-T-H. In fact, we're told that death is an enemy. The last enemy to be destroyed is death. See, death was given as a penalty to man. Remember, the wages of sin is death. The payoff for missing God. That's all sin means, is that you miss, the, you miss God. And I don't care if you stay, I mean, if you look at buildings, eh, you watch that kind of Hollywood movie, oh, the brother stay chalking them, eh? He jump, he jump, he in there, whoo, airborne. Smoke in the what you call that kind of matrix action and slow motion. Yee! He missed the building by one feet. What the result? Baka going splat. However high he stay, when he hit the ground, splat. That was one feet he missed him by, eh? The next guy, he run and he run and he run. He jumped, he jumped, he floating, he matrix out. He missed him by one eighth of an inch. What is the result? Same thing like the first guy who missed him by one foot. Splat. So. Missing the mark, that's what sin is. In fact, somebody even put, put it to words, S-I-N, self-imposed nonsense. You missed the mark with God. You and I exist with purpose. You, my friend, need to find out what your purpose in life is. The worst thing that can ever happen to anybody is to not have a vision of what your portion is in this life. Because we are all pieces of the body. And if you can think like the natural body, if he... The Creator is the head of the body, and we, then that makes us the many-membered body of Christ. You might be small God, 
The brother and sister next to you might be pancreas, might be bigot, might be the eyeball, I don't know. Whatever part you role you play, listen, you're not the total package. But you do have a role and you need to find out, pull down on the mind of God to find out your place in the matter. You need to fulfill your fun and function and fulfill your purposes because if you don't, then you make hard for everybody else. We know how that action works. It's like being saw on canoe. I don't fit in one canoe now, but I remember the days when I used to. Everybody do their load, but if you get one slack on top there, oh, you like whack them with the paddle, yeah? Or everybody start bad mountain, and next thing you know it, on the canoe, get all kind of action going down, bad blood going down. Everybody like throw blows or flip the canoe just for disqualify themselves because no sense go, go race, eh? But somebody gonna get mad at somebody if they don't do their load. Listen, you got to fulfill your purpose. Find out why God brought you forth. Find out what is your function and do your portion. Hear from God. Never mind wasting time trying to critique somebody else on how they're living before God. That's not your business. Before God they live, before God they die. He the master. See, you're going to serve somebody. You're going to be a slave to something. I've said this before and I think I need to re-say it again. Malachi 3 says that the Lord would open us, open us up. We're the windows of heaven where the Lord can flow through and we become that physical channel for the Spirit of God to get His business done in the earth. We always get on flip backwards. Yeah? We think he wants sugar daddy. We always tell him, oh, Lord, open up your will. Especially when we're in distress. That's usually the only time we usually pray. Oh, Lord, I need help, Lord. Open up your window. Pour me out a blessing. Listen, your interpretation of the word, wrong. Because he's saying, you the window that I want to open up and come through you, the channel, my sons, and get my business done. So you either window of heaven or there's another uh, option. You're a gate of hell. Jesus says to Peter, Peter, for thou art Peter upon me, the Pohakunui. See, his name Peter means pebble, shifty, like building one house on sand. Yeah? The Lord is saying, upon me, the kingdom of God will be built. I'm the Pohakunui, the great stone. The gates of hell shall not prevail against my kingdom. Listen, the Lord never said you're not going to come under attack. Anybody who give you a doctrine that, oh, going to be bed of roses, they're pulling your leg. They're lying to you. Listen, you will have challenges, but the Lord is raising up warriors and not wimps. Satan has to come under the judgments, and it's the sons of God that's going to enforce that victory over the entire satanic realm. I know I'm jumping a little bit ahead of myself, but let's go back and visit that garden scene. Since we're talking about spirit, soul, and body. The question, what part of the man died on that day when Adam, the first father, missed God? Well, we know when God would kick him out of the garden, they walked out. So physically, they were still alive. In fact, I think Adam lived to be 930 years. His wife, I don't know how long she would live. In fact, the oldest living guy in the scriptures lived to be 969 years old. His name was Methuselah. You know what's funny is that when God gave a word, you really got to take his word, incubate them inside your incubators, and feed that bug of faith. The abortion pill of the kingdom is doubt. So we need to lay hold with aggressiveness in our spirit from the time of John the Baptist to now. The kingdom of heaven suffers violence. The violent must take it by force. So when God gives a word, my friend, incubate it inside your now. Oh. Because there's going to come a time that as you build that faith in God, you're going to have to give birth to that word. And once it gives birth, I, I got to say, I, I always, this has been my prayer. I said, Lord, what you let me incubate, let me bring them forth. Let me birth them. And steward it and bring it to a place of maturity until it is capable of producing like seed. You see, this is what the kingdom of God is all about. In fact, when God did the restoration action over there in the a, in a, in a, uh, book of Genesis, that's exactly what he told them. He says, when he created the tree, he said, ah, that's all good. And the seed is within itself, and it brought forth like kind. So the beauty of being able to do that, I, I don't know about you, but to me, I think it's pretty cool. Now, man missed God by making a soulish decision. He chose your soul consists of your mind, you know, your ability to make decisions, your own will, of which God will never violate, and your emotions. That was all intact when man exited the garden. So that only leaves one option when the death penalty came. When the death penalty came, it was literally your awareness to God, who is spirit, man who's spirit, soul, and body, in complete, total communion. It was as if when man missed God, an eclipse came between your spirit and God's spirit. Your awareness to God went away. It was all on a soulish plane. Your mind, your will, and your intellect. When God booted them out of the garden, they walked out of the garden. 
soulishly led. You see, but because God is spirit, and we who worship Him must do it in spirit and in truth, He wants to bring us back aware to Him. So He prophesied. Listen to how he, what He said. And we're going to kind of progress from that in, in the upcoming broadcasts to come. He says to the woman, woman, you're going to have offspring. Serpent, you're going to have offspring in the future. I, God, going to create hostility between both seeds. Now, look at this now. We're talking about the sons of God and the sons of Satan. There's going to be a complete and total hostility between both. Now, that should uh, set something off in your spirit so that you can see that how violent of a time that we're living in. But God also predetermined the outcome who would be the winner. He says to the woman, he says, your seed will do an action against the seed of the serpent in the future. I, God, will see as a blow to the head. Then he said to the serpent, your offspring, serpent, will do an action against the seed of the woman in the future. I, God, will see as a small kind of bruise under the heel. Listen, God, who is spirit, had to make payment to buy back mankind. And the jurisdictional rights that was given to the sons back in the garden that man forfeited. See, in our rebellion and disobedience to God, we never only get the boot, but we also forfeited the right to rule and reign with him. Remember, he told him to take uh, creation, bring, take dominion, bring creation under subjection in all of that action. Well, man forfeited his place as sons of God to rule and reign with him. But God prophesied on how he would restore man's awareness back to him. He said that he would come through a line and eventually he had handpicked a certain line to be the chosen incubator. We know her name Mary right now. She was the chosen incubator eventually. God himself came in bodily form. We know him to be Jesus. Now I know some of you thinking, oh, wait a minute. What are you trying to say? Jesus is the God man or God in physical form? Exactly, that's what I'm saying. How can I make such a statement? Well, the word of God says in uh, John uh, chapter 1, verse 1. In the beginning, are we talking dateless past, yeah? Before Adam's time, before the garden scene. In the beginning was the Word. Well, Jesus is the Word. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. The Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. John 1, 14 says, And the Word was made flesh, dwelt among us. We beheld Him, the glory of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. So, we see the God man in full manifestation. Uh, Colossians 2.9, I believe it, it's, it's there, where it says that Christ housed the fullness of the Godhead bodily. So he was the manifestation of God, came in, and our faith in God's provision of Christ literally brings restoration in our spirit back to God. Now here's something really interesting. John 14. People all where Jerusalem, wherever Jesus went, they believed in God. But they never believed that Jesus was the full manifestation of God in human form. So Jesus had to come and even address his disciples, Philip. And he said, hey, Philip. Philip, by the way, we tell him, ah, uh, you say, you know the Father. Show us the Father. Jesus turned and he looked at his disciples. He says, Philip, how long have I got to be with you? And you still don't know me? In fact, in verse 1, he says, if you believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house, plenty mansions. Listen, what is our Father's house? Our Heavenly Father, we create everything. We already established that fact. You who dwell within his, his world, this is His house. In my Father's house, get plenty mansions. What's a, what's a mansion? Well, it's a little, it's, it's really a dwelling place, a place where you can take up residence. You know, raise your family like that. You and I are houses for the Lord to take up His residence in. Jesus, in, in His prayer, uh, John chapter, uh, you can read 14, 15, 16, and 17. I think it was in chapter 17. You're going to find out that Jesus is praying. He says, Father, you know like how you was in me and I'm in you? Let us take up our residence in them that the world may know. So the Lord wants to fill your house. He wants to occupy your house, my friends. And that's where we, we want it. Jesus says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man open the door, I'm going to come in. I'm going to stop with him and he with me. Listen, Satan wants to Take full advantage of your vulnerability, or should I say, your lack of submission to God. Us, we like make immunity for our family. We don't like nothing harm, bring harm into our family. Listen, there's a war going on that has already been won, but Satan's so prideful. He's not going to own up to the fact that he's a loser, that he already lost the war. You and I, as the sons of God, must appropriate God's provision in our faith that Christ Jesus is that provision. It brings, it takes away the eclipse, 
and he makes us aware to the Spirit of God. The problem is that in you and I, we have the soul part again. That's why Paul said, may the Lord bless you, spirit, soul, body. Your soul has a conflict with the Spirit of God in you. We get internal civil war going on. You see, your soul led you for so long until you, you realized that Christ was the provision. When you made that confession of faith and appropriated God's provision, Christ literally became the death penalty. The payment of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus. Listen, we transfer our junk on Him, on the Lord Jesus. We take on His innocence. He dies in our place. We go innocent before God. That's the provision made. And not only that, but there's an inheritance that we lay hold to. My friends, lay hold to your inheritance. Romans 16, 20 says that the God of peace is going to bruise Satan under your heel shortly. By Christ coming into the earth and as a mere human and literally wiping Satan out by his prostrated heart before the Father, he won the battle. Prophecy says that there would come uh, one as a, as a lamb coming in innocently to the slaughter. And he's going to lay down his life. That's the Messiah was going to come. But then the prophecy also goes on to say that there's going to come one, the lion of the tribe of Judah, where he's going to roar and scatter all his enemies. Listen, if you had your choice, which Messiah would you choose? The weak one that coming to, to die and let everybody mock spit on him? Or the one coming in on a white horse with a sword in his mouth roaring? The tribe, the lion of the tribe of Judah. Which one would you choose? I would choose this one. I don't like the wimp one. But the reality of the matter is that the prophecy spoke of the same person. First time Christ came, he came literally to lay his life down. But now he's coming through his sons as the lion of the tribe of Judah. Listen, my friends, you have the right to be free. Continue to tune into our upcoming broadcast because I believe what we have to offer has enough mana to not only break your cage that you don't know you're in, but literally let your spirit fly free and let your communion begin. May the Lord bless you, keep you, make his face shine upon you. You be blessed. From this kahu to all you my fellow kanakas. Aloha, ahuiho, e malamapo. Precious Jesus is my